has been said that if there is ever to be such a thing as a true universal language, it will most likely be expressed in the realms of mathematics, geometry, energy patterns, and frequency. Could it be that this language, or at least the foundation of it, already exists here on Earth? Is it possible that over the course of thousands of years, we have been somehow guided in the process of creating this new form of communication? And if so, what type of information will be conveyed through it that could not be expressed any other way? In the search for answers, we must be prepared to trek through both time and space, to open our eyes and minds wide enough to notice compelling coincidences, and to stand back far enough to see if the building blocks of some kind of mathematical, spatial, frequency-based language emerge. But before we begin our journey, we will pause here in the present day to notice some of the ways that we measure and tabulate the world around us. This is an important step, for how we count and measure things can be as revealing as why we count them. First, we will take a look at the way we measure time. For all practical purposes, the smallest unit is one second, and we all know it takes 60 seconds to make a minute, and then 60 of these minutes to make an hour. This hour, of course, is the unit by which we divide our days, and these days become months, years, decades, centuries, and so on. Speaking of 60, let's take a moment to notice that all geometry, whether it is two or three dimensional, is also derived from base 60 mathematics that provide the foundation for a 360 degree circle, which in turn provides us with all the angles and formulas for creating virtually every shape known to humankind. Now let's look at how many cultures from all over the world have chosen to count and group things. Right away, we see that we have been attracted to the number 12. 12 eggs in a dozen, 12 months in a year, 12 inches in a foot, 12 signs of the zodiac. Strangely, whether it's tallying disciples or mythical gods, the number 12 appears often in the telling of our greatest stories about ourselves. And what about distance? Your local town might be measured in meters or other units, but when we talk about measuring our planet, the standards we all use revert back to base 60 units of miles, minutes, or geometrical degrees. Are you noticing the pattern here? We seem to be encountering a lot of 12s and 60s. Are they related? And if so, how? To answer that piece of the puzzle, we must travel roughly 5,000 years back in time to visit the ancient Sumerian culture of Mesopotamia, for here is where our 1260-based math comes from. This counting system, which was invented by the same people who produced the world's first written language, involved counting the knuckles of the four long fingers on one hand and then multiplying them by all five digits on the other hand. If you do this, you will get a maximum number of 12 knuckles times five fingers, which of course totals 60. How these cosmic jumps in language and mathematics occurred so suddenly is open to debate. But it is interesting to note that the ancient Sumerians themselves wrote about being given this information by sky god visitors they called the Anunnaki. Who and what the Anunnaki were is a hotly contested subject, but one thing that cannot be denied is the fact that over 5,000 years ago, a mathematical system was born that incredibly still serves us today. So now that we have our various units of measurement, all based on the Sumerian 1260 counting system, Let's jump forward to a few pivotal moments in history and see what other numbers, patterns, and synchronicities appear. In the 6th century BC on the Greek island of Samos, the famed mathematician Pythagoras led a school of thought that married philosophy, mathematics, music, and of course geometry. And while Pythagoras did not discover advanced geometry, he did apply it in new ways, especially to music. For instance, he noticed that when a tautened string was plucked, it would create a tone. And when that string was divided in half, it would make the same tone only twice as high in pitch. Pythagoras then came up with numerical ratios based on harmonic fifths, and this led to the creation of the musical scale found at the root of most modern music. It is important to note that according to Pythagoras, all musical notes were found by using mathematics, and as such were given number values according to their placement in a kind of master grid. For instance, by using fifths beginning from note number one, he was eventually guided to note 27. And to find the same note twice as high in pitch, he simply kept doubling it to 54, 108, 216, 432, and so on up the scale. If you've ever heard of Pythagorean tuning, you know that the number 432 is quite important. 
To Pythagoras himself, it probably wouldn't have stood out more than any other in his numerical grid. But in our quest to find a universal language based on mathematics and frequency, this particular note represents a significant piece of coincidental evidence. You see, many ancient musical instruments, from Tibetan bowls to Native American flutes, happen to produce the same tone, a tone that vibrates at 432 cycles per second. That's compelling, but even more intriguing is the fact that Pythagoras was not calculating vibration cycles to find tone 432. It just happens to be the same number. What's more, for decades, most modern musical instruments were also tuned to this same fourth octave A, with a value of 432 cycles. How could this be? Who chose this particular note as the keystone for instrument tuning, and more importantly, why? Here is where a deeper mystery begins to emerge, and to explore it we will need to go back to Pythagoras' other passion, geometry. It is not an exaggeration to say that to Pythagoras and his disciples, geometry and math held a key to the nature of all life everywhere, and maybe it does. Let's look at the first four geometric shapes, the circle, triangle, square, and pentagon. In each of them are angles of degrees that when added together always total a specific number relative to that particular shape. For instance, if we take a triangle, the sum total of all three interior angles is always 180. For both the square and circle it is 360. For a pentagon it is 540. Now at this moment, let's step back and look at these numbers in a different way, as there seems to be something about them that reaches beyond a simple sum of angles. Did you notice that they happen to be in the same numerical neighborhood as tone 432? What's more, they all add up to 9, just like 432. As an experiment, let's take a look at the numbers found in basic geometric shapes, then apply those numbers as vibration cycles to hear the tones they produce. First, let's listen to what the 180 total degrees contained in a triangle sound like. And here's a squares and circles 360 in cycles per second. A perfect octave up from the triangle. What about the pentagon at 540? That sounds like a harmonic fifth of the other two. That's interesting. What are these tones? They are F sharp and it's perfect harmonic fifth of C sharp. Let's keep going. What does a hexagon 720 sound like? Another F sharp. Here's a seven sided septagon which totals 900. This is an A sharp, which happens to be the note required to complete an F sharp major chord in perfect three part harmony. And finally the octagon, where we get 1080, another C sharp. Suddenly, Geometry is expressed by tones, and these tones just happen to create the most beautiful form of music, a perfect three-part major chord in the key of F-sharp. Is this something we've been missing for years? Is it important? To the famous philosopher and mathematician Plato, the answer would have been a resounding yes for it is Plato who advanced the study of two-dimensional geometry into three-dimensional geometry, and who began to recognize that nature, whether expressed as a tone, the petal design of a flower, or the spiraling design of a seashell, seemed to follow a 3D mathematical pattern. In fact, it became an obsession of Plato to try and find the simplest three-dimensional geometric shapes, and his quest ultimately revealed what we now call the Platonic solids. In essence, these forms represent the most elemental construction blocks found both in human-made and natural forms. So let's see if and how they fit into our geometry tone grid. First, there is the tetrahedron, or a three-sided pyramid comprised of four interlocking triangles. As we did before, let's add up all the angles found in those four triangles. The answer, 720, which we have already seen is the tone F-sharp. Next we have the cube, whose six 360 degree squares totals 2160. What does it sound like?
2160 is a high C sharp, and as you will see later, a very interesting number for other reasons as well. Next up is the octahedron. Constructed of eight triangles, this shape totals 1440, which is another perfect F sharp higher up the scale. The icosahedron is made up of 20 triangles, so the total number of degrees is 3600. As a tone, 3600 vibration cycles create the A sharp needed to complete yet another F sharp major chord that sounds like this. At this point, we have seen how two- and three-dimensional geometry can be expressed by the notes found in an F-sharp major chord. Could this also be true with what is known as sacred geometry? To find out, we will first need to build a design called the germ of life, which, when repeated, goes on to reveal the seed of life, then flower of life pattern found at sacred sites all over the world. First, we start with a circle at 360 degrees, which is the familiar F-sharp. We then add our second circle, bringing the total to 720, another F-sharp. Three circles totals 1080, which provides the harmonic fifth of C-sharp. Four circles is 1440, another F-sharp. Five circles totals 1800, or the A-sharp needed to once again provide the harmonic third of an F-sharp major chord. And finally the sixth circle, which brings the total to 2160, another C sharp. Amazing! It's as if we can now both see and hear the flower of life pattern that has intrigued humankind for thousands of years. So now we have two-dimensional geometry, three-dimensional geometry, and even sacred geometry being represented by different variations of an F sharp major chord. How is this not common knowledge? How have we missed this connection? There are actually three explanations. One, for reasons ranging from the mundane to the conspiratorial, musical instruments are no longer tuned to an A vibrating at 432 cycles per second, but rather 440. Two, modern tuning calls for equal temperament, which no longer adheres to Pythagoras' whole number simplicity. And three, the tuning method required to reveal geometric shapes is based on a mathematical grid rather than mathematical ratios. This grid, if it had a name, would probably be called something like factor 9, because the number 9 is found not only in the sum of every note on the grid, but also as the number required to move up or down the scale. For instance, if we started at note A at 216 cycles, all we would have to do is add or subtract the number 9 to reveal all the other tones in that octave. And it is here, on this incredible factor 9 grid, that we find not just some of our geometric numbers, but all of them. Conversely, modern A440 tuning reveals not one correlation to geometric numbers. Now let's go back for a moment and take a look at one of these numbers, 2160, the number expressed by both the cube and the germ of life pattern. You may have already noticed that without the zero, it is exactly half of our magic 432. That's worth noting. But what is even more intriguing is the way this number keeps showing up in other large-scale measurements. To discover one of these measurements, we will need to jump forward from Plato's time to when the Mayan civilization was flourishing, 